I'm going to be talking about the origins of biodiversity, something that is particularly important as an underlying process in all aspects of biology. Now, Cambridge has a particular connection to this through Charles Darwin. Now, Darwin is famously the inventor of the idea, the inventor of the theory of evolution, or the origin of species by means of natural selection. Now, Cambridge's connection to this is that Darwin was a student here. Now, admittedly, when he was a student, biology didn't exist as a subject. In fact, natural sciences didn't exist as a subject. But his presence in the university, we would like to think, had some influence on the development of his approach to science in later years. Now, Darwin not only wasn't studying biology, he actually wasn't a very good student when he was here. He spent most of his time collecting beetles rather than studying. Now, this is not something we would encourage our students to do today. Evolution by natural selection, as described by Darwin, is the most important idea in all of biology because it makes sense of what is otherwise an impossibly diverse subject. What we're dealing with ranges from biochemistry through to ecology of ecosystems and even the working of the mind. And it stretches from the origins of life more than four billion years ago to today. All of this complex diversity can only be understood in the light of evolution. The University Museum of Zoology at Cambridge does have a lot of Darwin specimens, including some of his famous finches and other material from the Galapagos Islands. But probably more notable is his collection of beetles. That very same collection that he started as an undergraduate and carried on developing throughout his life. Although Darwin didn't use his beetles in developing his evolutionary theories, he was right to be obsessed by them. Beetles are extraordinarily diverse. Half a million species have been described so far and estimates suggest that this is just a small fraction of the total number that exist. Beetles and other insects are particularly important in modern studies of evolution. Indeed, Drosophila melanogaster fruit flies are famously associated with genetic research. Although, Drosophilas are much more diverse than that, with 1,500 species described in that genus. The reason that insects are so useful in evolutionary research is that they are essentially modular, being broken up into distinct segments. A genetic oddity in one segment doesn't necessarily affect the rest of the animal, allowing us to study what genes do to distinct structures and segments. Although vertebrates have the same sort of basic plan and some traces of segmentation can be seen, for example in the skeleton, the body is much more integrated, so it's much harder to tease out the effect of a single mutation in a vertebrate as they tend to have knock-on effects on many different systems. From the study of mutations in insects, we can tell that the great diversity of insects comes out of changes in a relatively small number of genes affecting things like the wings or the legs. Most notable of these mutations are those that affect transcription factors. These are not genes themselves in that they don't code for a particular structure. Instead they affect the expression of structural genes, determining when and where the gene is turned on or off. In the case of fruit flies we've studied structures like the legs the antennae and the mouth parts. In butterflies our focus has tended to be on colour patterns. Butterfly wing patterns are fantastically diverse, but they have some common features such as stripes or brands and very often spots. The wing spots crop up in most butterfly groups and these have a relatively simple genetic control with their position being controlled by some common gene regulators. 
Slight modification of the regulators may shift the position of the eye spots to some extent. More interestingly, duplications of these regulators results in duplication of the spots, so small mutations can change single spots into rows of spots, or the reverse can happen, and numbers of spots can reduce. The end point of this is that similar patterns can evolve in different butterflies as a result of similar changes in these common regulators. And the ease with which these similarities can develop give rise to the great mimicry complexes of the Heliconius butterflies of South America. And also much less well known but equally dramatic mimicry in African and East Asian butterflies. As we can see with these examples, small changes in regulatory genes can cause big changes in the organism, altering the number of legs, the position and pattern of the wings, the shape of the jaws, or even where its eyes are positioned. But mutations by themselves don't lead to evolutionary change or the origin of new species. Firstly, they have to lead to changes in protein structures and from that into how cells function, how the organism develops, and ultimately to how it functions as a living being. In order to understand how a feature evolves, you have to have some understanding of the processes of mutation in the genes. You also need to have a sense of how that structure develops and how it's influenced by the development of other parts of the body. But even that is only the start. As Darwin recognised, selection is a very large part of the story. And selection is all about how the organism interacts with its environment. If we take changes in an insect's wing, these are going to lead to changes in how the wing moves, and so how the insect flies. That in turn may have an impact on its ability to escape from predators, or for it to be a predator itself. Alternatively, it may change the appearance of that wing making the animal more or less visible to predators or to mates. And that visibility will be affected by the physical environment. If it's a visually complicated environment, mutations that make the wing more visible will attract the attention of potential mates, but may also attract predators. If we take the classic example of the peppered moth and industrial melanism, it's well known that before the Industrial Revolution, the peppered moth was a pale coloured species, and that industrial pollution altered conditions, favouring the black form of the peppered moth. Studies of 18th and 19th century museum collections showed that black mutations occurred from time to time in several different moth species in North America and in Europe. And research on those species has recently shown that there is a weakness in one part of a gene called cortex which is involved in the pale coloured in the peppered moth and in the pale brindle beauty and the scalloped hazel moth. So black moths of all of these three species have appeared as rare mutations from time to time because of this genetic weakness. But they never had any chance of survival because they were too conspicuous to predators up until industrialization, which then changed the environmental conditions. In the case of the peppered moth, the current black mutation seems to have originated in about the 1820s, whereas the pale brindle beauty and the scalloped hazel, their mutations are older. But the dark forms of all three remained very rare until the 1840s, when the environment changed. Here a fuller picture of the peppered moth uses the standard story of natural selection combined with the information from old museum collections and the new information from modern genetics. That means that natural selection may work in different ways in different places depending upon the complexity of the environment or the abundance of predators. Both of those fall into what is classically considered to be ecology. So in order to understand how species or even just their features evolve, we really need to have an understanding of the cells, developmental processes, 
physiology and ecology. For biology, there are no separate specialisms anymore. Everything is interlinked. And that means that whatever you're interested in, you need to have some understanding of the wider picture. And however narrow your field may appear to be, it feeds into the knowledge we need if we are to manage the world's pressing issues, whether those are of food supply, climate change, or of pandemics.